So John and Paul are sticking around. The steering committee, with the help of the nominating committee, which consisted of Deanna Markham, Carla Hayden, Dr. Hayden, me, uh, the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, and Mackenzie Smith, university librarian at uh, UC Davis. We helped get a board slate together, and the steering committee chose this board recently. Um, Paul Courant, John Palfrey, now we will be joined by Laura DeBonis and Kathy Casserly. Please come up on stage and join us. Luis Herrera, the uh, librarian of the San Francisco Public Library, is the fifth member of the board. He couldn't join us today, but actually is joining us by video later, right? A little bit afterwards, okay. In the meantime, we'd like to ask each of the board members, why don't we start with Monsieur Caron, because I know he has to leave us soon, uh, to just introduce themselves, talk a little bit about why they agreed to serve on the, on the board of DPLA. Just let people get to know you a little bit if they don't. Paul? Okay, hi everybody. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, and uh, why did I agree to be on this board? That's a very good question. Um, because, as the song says, this could be the start of something big. Uh, actually, the start was the conference that Bob convened two years ago, which, uh, which, has, which has led to all this. Uh, but we were pretty unclear two years ago, except for that wonderful statement, what this was. And it turns out, um, and I think this is fascinating, that the, the opening part of this uh, is the bringing together of, of the local parts of our own history and self uh, as a country. That wasn't clear that that was going to be the, the, the opening part. It's terrific that that's what it is. Um, the diversity of our country, the, the similarities and differences across local notions of what's important, bourbon, ice, Interesting that those were the two things that we uh, um, and ha, I think there's a possibility of unity here. Um, uh, uh, you know, are just exciting and fun in, in the way that libraries, cultural institutions are exciting and fun. They let us dip back to where we were, think about who we are, uh, what, we might, what we might become. And this, this library, this digital public library, I think provides an opportunity uh, across many places, many people, um, to allow for that kind of interchange, which is the kind of thing that we, we just enjoy so much, right? When we, when we open up the library in the morning, when we show up in somebody else's library in the afternoon, uh, not just libraries, museums, archives, many other institutions, that's the, the it's that, that pure fun uh, of those experiences as well as the sort of deep understanding that comes from that kind of fun. So I think it's just going to be very interesting uh, and that the digital world allows us, and this has been my pitch all along, to share in ways that we just couldn't do before. So all, again, all of those, those newspapers, those stories out of the past, that we're going to be able to index and share and, and have with each other. I have to put in a pitch for a piece that I put in a pitch for all the time. It says, so right, it says government, as if I were a fan of government. I actually, I actually sort of am um, government by of and for the people. Um, so so uh, one of the things that I hope this library will become is a place where, where essentially all of the publications of governments in the United States will be available to all of the citizens of the United States to be able to use to make sense of. Um, that's a very natural thing for a public library uh, of, of America to do. In the, in the tradition of local culture being so important, which is I think where we, where we very much are here, uh, the reason I have to leave early is that it's homecoming weekend at the University <laughs> of Michigan. There are people who don't know what homecoming weekend is None of those people are from the Midwest, uh, and uh, uh, you know I'm I'm the dean of the library, and there are lots of people on Homecoming Weekend that I really want to be talking to, and who I hope will wanting to be wanting to talk to me. So uh, it's in that context that I have to leave early. But thank you very much for 
for, for supporting and being part of this institution. And Bob, thank you very much for making it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to go. Going to take off. See you. Bye. OK. Bye. Catch that plane, Paul. <laughs> JP. Do I get the same question or you have you a different one for me nope, anymore? You get the same question. No, no, I'll go. Um, so I'm, I'm shy about having been asked to be on this board, but I'm delighted and grateful and humbled by it. Um, there, there are two reasons why I said yes. Um, one is I can't think of any more important project to be working on in my life at this moment. Yeah. And I, mean, I love working in education and I love being a trustee of the Knight Foundation. Um, and I think that these things sort of come together in the sense of seeking to make for the United States a resource and a platform that improve our democracy in a really fundamental way. And I think it is about education. It is about informed and engaged communities. And I think it's something that if we can get out of our own way in a funny sense, it's a collective action problem, if we could figure out how these great you know, state projects and local projects and university projects and other projects can actually come together, um, get our egos a little bit out of the way in a sense, that we can create something so much bigger than what um, we would do if we work separately. It's just a really basic American idea. Um, I love one of the things that Bob Darton has said consistently is this is a marriage of the sort of crazy aspirational American um, attitude, but also a pragmatic can-do kind of thing. And, and to me, it's that, it's that kind of project. So I can't imagine a better use of my own time as a, uh, as a volunteer and as a sort of activist to, to make something like this go. And there's a second reason which is sort of more procedural though, which um, is something that we talked about yesterday extensively in the future of DPLA se sessions, which is how do we create a different kind of digital age institution that isn't the classic corporation, it isn't the classic bureaucracy, it is, as Maureen uh, Sullivan kept saying yesterday, a responsive ad hocacy. It's a networked organization that really pulls in lots of people to create something where we have a shared goal. So um, one of my commitments as a new board member is to say, even though we've uh, switched officially from being a truly distributed um, sort of collective action project to one that now has a formal board and it's you know chartered in Delaware and all the rest is actually to have it function much as it has been, which is really having the decision making highly distributed in interesting ways. Of course, as a board, there are certain strict fiduciary obligations we have and may have to break ties and so forth. But I want to see every member of the community who's been working on this, um, working on this even harder and more going forward and that we're actually going to grow rather than retract. So figuring out how to structure the organization so that the amazing people we've just welcomed on the board as the, um, on the steering committee up here um, will be more engaged, not less, going forward. Thanks. And, you know, Laura, John just spoke about creating something truly big. And I know your past experience includes working on the Google Books project that we think of as an extremely big project. How does that experience bear on uh, your decision to, to join this? And where do you see the promise in DPLA? Yeah, I would also like to start by saying it feels like a real privilege and an honor to be asked to serve. And I'm so excited about the, the um, the future of DPLA. Um, I feel a little bit like DPL DPLA is Google Books recharged or something because I think a lot of the principles and the process around the start of DPLA has really involved the right people, the right time, uh, or the right people, the right larger communities in a way that um, you know, I'm not going to say anything about books that I would you know potentially regret, but I feel like DPLA is really the right people, the right process the right funders, the right leadership, and it's been a, a great thing to watch sort of from the periphery working on Paul Courant's working group, mm -hmm. and um, I'm, I'm excited about the future of, of what this is going to be. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit about your work in the past before jumping into <laughs> Okay. Why? Uh, so um, let me start and echo um, just that steering committee that was up here. This is a very big shoes uh, that we have to fill, and I am very honored and privileged to be here. Um, those of you who might know of a little bit of my background, I was a program officer and then the initiative director of the Open Educational Resources Initiative at the Hewlett Foundation. So for 10 years, I've been working, um, well, my, for 10 years, I worked on the idea of opening up content, opening up educational, open educational resources, using the Creative Commons open licensing platform to put content out for the world. And many of the projects were based in the US, but it was also very global in nature because obviously of the distributed uh, network effect that we have. 
And part of that work, I think, very much parallels, which is why I'm so excited and I was just thrilled to be invited and quite honored because the work in field building and open educational resources very much dovetails with what's happening here in the Digital Public Library of America. And what I see is that there are multiple ecosystems that are developing in some ways, um, disparate ways, siloed ways, but they'll be connected once they really are strong. And the connections in open educational resources are now clearly global around the world. We have a network of affiliates. I'm now the CEO of Creative Commons. And so we have a network of affiliates around the globe as well. And I can see all these pieces coming together as well as the big plays in data and science and in government. Um, and so for me to have the opportunity to really see these pieces is pretty incredible. I think um, I was mentioning a little bit this morning too, uh, um, for me, what part of this excitement is, this is a big, bold idea. This is groundbreaking. This is pioneering. This is incredibly difficult. Um, but this will be incredibly fun. And this is the white space that we're all trying to tackle. And to have moved so quickly, um, I think to get to this point is really quite um, amazing. Um, and I also think the challenges will be ahead and we have to persevere, we have to keep our eye on the prize. There will be some bumps in the road when you develop new um, ecosystems, sure. such as the DPLA, uh, but that, it's a huge sandbox. And so I think of the DPLA as a platform. I think all the networks and the coordination that will come together will be amazing, but then we can't even begin to anticipate what it will look like in five years that will get built on top of this because we're building this infrastructure that I think will be incredibly robust and will change the nature of how we think about sharing and about digital resources. So for me, it's very, very exciting. Thank you. I want to get into your vision for the, you know, for the next period, for the year. But let's first hear from Luis Herrera. I think we're queuing him up. Are we not on video? Who's joining us from? Greetings yes. from San Francisco. Yeah. I'm Luis Herrera, <laughs> city librarian. I wish I could be there in person at DPLA Midwest in the great city of Chicago, but unfortunately, I won't be able to join you due to a prior commitment. First of all, thank you to the members of the DPLA Steering Committee for your vote of confidence in appointing me to the Charter Board of DPLA. I am honored and delighted to serve. I also want to extend my sincere appreciation to the Steering Committee and members of the work streams who have demonstrated remarkable leadership and commitment to the vision of DPLA. The DPLA is off to a very strong start and has demonstrated excellent progress in a relatively short time. I hope that the work streams and the steering committee will work closely with the board so that together we will succeed in our goal to launch the DPLA prototype in the spring of 2013. The DPLA has at its very core the value of inclusivity. The fact that it welcomes diverse viewpoints and voices in creating a free, open, and sustainable national digital library resource is very appealing to me. As a public librarian, I am excited about the possibilities that DPLA has in terms of partnerships and collaborations among many types of libraries. This will ultimately bring our collections to a wider audience. This sharing of our nation's heritage makes for a richer, deeper and more meaningful knowledge network. Congratulations to the board and best wishes for a successful DPLA Midwest Forum. Thanks, Luis. <laughs> Before we start talking about your vision and the, the things that you'd like to see happen with DPLA in the near future, I just wanted to open it up and see if anyone out there had any questions for the board if I can see them. No, none for now. So do you want to build a little bit on the promise that you see? What areas, you know, we're starting here with cultural heritage content. There's so much that we want to provide access to. You have a lot of expertise obviously with, uh, the, the, with licensing and with restrictions on content, trying to open up content. Where do you see that the DPLA uh, could be helpful in moving more content out towards users? Um, so I just, I think it's starting from completely the right place with the metadata. Yeah. And because now we'll be able to discover and find the gems and the gems will be that much more um, 
kind of fluid, I think, across the ecosystem as we think about that. Yeah. So I think that is critically important. I think, um, I think about two pieces, and so this is a bit of a continuum from my, my work in open educational resources, but it's very much a continuum because this is how the interplay of the ecosystem happens. But it's about leveling the playing field so that everyone can have access to these great gems that exist and that they, don't, they aren't housed in separate repositories, but we, that we can find them and they, we can be networked across them. But that also that they can be reused to the extent it makes sense. And so that's where the open licensing makes complete sense. Going a bit to, to Paul's comment, you know, the public should have access to what the public pays for. Right. And this is something that's really, really important. And as we think about ac ac um, access and if we th think about different um, assets and educational assets, we often reproduce the same assets that sit in different parts of this country or different regions. Just because, not because we don't want to share, but because we don't necessarily always think about sharing. And so we have to change that default. We have to be thinking about sharing in a much more ready way as a first step. And when it doesn't make sense to share for whatever reason, then you opt out of sharing. Right. But in public institutions with public dollars, as we think about it, we can really, we don't have to start from scratch again and again, and we can build on and we can extend. And I think that's very much the power as we move ahead. So you're a fan of, or you approve of the decision that was made to, to include only CC0 licensed metadata? Very. Very much. Okay. <laughs> very, okay, yes. Great. I mean, I think it's, this is the moment in time when you set the stage. Yep. And setting the stage in this way, I think, that is going to create the multiplier effects as we move ahead. So absolutely. I want to push on that a little bit and just see how can we leverage that decision, do you think, in the community? Is there, is there work we can do around just advocating for that? Um, do you have experience that would help us think about how we present that? There are some yeah. institutions that are a little uh, timid or fearful about opening up their metadata in that way. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying to, uh, to, to, to convey how important that is. So, so I think... Um, in general, it's often because this is new, yep. and so we have to share the ideas. We have to make the value proposition very clear. Yep. We have to put that value proposition on the table, and they have to begin. And so, as part of it's just educating because this is all new. You, you tend to do what you're you're used to as yep. opposed to what might be different. And I think the way to step into that is for uh, different institutions to just do a pilot. Right. Uh, this is this has kind of been the process I've used all along the way. So that if you just start with a pilot and you start with an idea and you start with some metadata that you maybe not feel is, is as high risk, which you'll actually see that when you put it out there for others, they'll take it, they'll build on it, they'll extend it. People will find it in ways that they weren't able to before. Yeah. And so um, this was very much a strategy we used in open educational resources. We encourage institutions to start with a pilot. And when they did, they saw these amazing effects and then they would open more and more. And so I think one of the, the challenges is sometimes we have this vision and we want people to jump to the vision right away. Mm -hmm. But we have to build a bridge to the vision. And I think that's going to be part of the challenge and the strategic and the tactical initiatives that the board thinks about along with the, the full community about how do we build that bridge. You'll have some early leaders. You'll have some others who will, for whatever reasons, are going to be taking steps at a different timeline. But we want to be inclusive of everyone who does that. Great. JP, do you want to talk about some of the, the, the big opportunities for the next couple of months? You're nice, more. I feel like I get more than enough airtime, so I, I should be really brief and, and turn it over to Laura. Uh, one of the fun parts about this transition is that um, though three of us have been on the steering committee, we're adding two new members and a lot of intelligence and experience in Laura and, and Kathy. So um, that's more interesting than hearing from me. Um, I will say that the, the, um, the next few months, I think, are about going from a whole bunch of ideas and uh, planning for and executing on that um, and having something to present to the public in April 2013. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a short period of time. We are not going to have the entire DPLA built out. We need to manage the expectations so we'll have something that's wonderful and interesting and evocative, but it's nowhere near where we're going to get. And I think this was, was Kathy's point. Um, and in a way, I'd rather emphasize uh, the, the community than I would the product, just because I think the product is going to be so different and so much more wonderful several years from now than it's going to be in April. What I really want to emphasize is how are we thinking about informing and engaging people as we go along and building a group of people who are not just psyched about working on this project, but I think when you heard the Content Hub um, 
uh, descriptions, you can see in Minnesota, in Kentucky, in Georgia, there can be people who are engaging with these materials, whether it's someone bringing something out of their attic, or it's someone helping put metadata on, or it's a librarian helping to curate it, or it's a librarian at Harvard or a, a big institution who's helping to digitize things. We're going to be building a ton of skills here. So you can think about this in lots and lots of ways, but I think the multiplier effect of this project is going to be about informed and engaged communities and people who are able to have an active role in creating this knowledge resource. So um, I guess in the next several months, I would de-emphasize the actual build and sort of re-emphasize the, kind of the, the people aspect of the project. Yeah. And I think added to that, one of the things that I found very remarkable about this process is how the library community has been so supportive and included in every step of the way. And I think that's a really important message to the broader world or mm -hmm. the United States or even globally, as we heard earlier, that that this is really a grassroots effort in a way that none of the other efforts in this realm have really ever been before. And I think that's really remarkable and, and wonderful about this effort. And I think it's a real asset to what's trying to be done. So, Do you want to talk about just some of the formal things that are happening over the next months? Um, everyone who was with us yesterday knows that there is a new DPLA uh, org, there's DPLA Incorporated, and you're beginning a, a search now for an executive director. There are these procedural things that are happening. Uh, what are you looking for in the executive director? What types of qualities do you think would, would you know, add up to make someone who can lead this to the next step, next level? I'll, I'll jump in and start and then let yeah. you jump in. Um, I was saying in an earlier conversation that I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for someone. I mean, to be able to lead an effort like this, it's pretty cool. which will, I think, change the face of how we think about the assets and content and the library materials is just, I think, is remarkable. So I think we need someone who has kind of that blend of vision and uh, leadership and can bring the community together, but it's also someone who can also really make it happen. Yeah. as well, and so there's a bit of a range that we're thinking of, so it has to be someone who can really lead the effort, but also um, help think about the work streams and the, and the implementation in a very real way. Um, and I mean, I just think it's extraordinary, and so I'm, obviously we'll all be sharing this job description once it's created with the, the broader community, but I, I'm sure we'll have a really star person who will come together. So we'll have this star person, and we'll have a small core, truly, at the center of the DPLA, Inc., is not being planned to be a large organization. It's gonna be a tight, small organization. Where do you see, again, the opportunities? There's so many uh, organizations here and friends that have helped, that have contributed to DPLA. And this is the way Europeana works. Europeana has a small core with institutions and organizations that work and feed into it. Is this the kind of model that you see working long-term for DPLA? How can organizations here think about the future with DPLA? I think I would use kind of a software model for how people can kind of stay involved going forward, which is the developer conference. I mean, mm -hmm. in a sense, this community is the developer community of, of the DPLA, and I feel like, I, I don't think we as a board have really ne necessarily settled on the right format and the feeding mm -hmm. in of the various committees, et cetera, et cetera, but I feel like maintaining the idea of having the community, the, the broadest possible community be supportive and interactive as much as possible and having developer conventions essentially um, is probably something I would advocate going forward so that we can really be in touch with the community, hear what's on people's minds, um, and make sure we're responding to the needs of the broader community that, that the, G, the DPLA is professionally serving. So I would just echo what my smarter colleagues have just said. I think, I think we have absolutely our work cut out for us in terms of finding the right person and, mm -hmm. and the right structure, but I think our commitment is in, uh, in these clear, inclusive ways. Just in terms of next practical steps, which I imagine was part of your yeah. question, Maura, um, we have created the DPLA Inc. as a Delaware corporation, um, but there's a fair amount more logistically to do. We're making it into a nonprofit, so we still have to get the IRS to commit to that in the next several months, which we hope will happen. Uh, we are, we've filed a very initial form of the articles and 
uh, of incorporation and bylaws, but we're going to be updating those to try to reflect the community values. So we have very bare bones documents initially been gathering through the governance work stream, lots of information about how people think we should govern things. And that I think goes ultimately to what Laura is talking about. What's the structure of participation? Do, are, do we create committees under the board that are the work stream? Something like that probably makes a lot of sense because we want to perpetuate this, uh, this form of engagement. I'd love to see an annual event at least that's kind of like Wikimania, um, which as you may know is a gathering of uh, the Wikimaniacs who edit the, um, the pages most actively um, and the board participates and so forth, but it's really a very open community. And I would imagine it'd be great to have you know, uh, library students and retired librarians and active people from the archives and museum community and so forth all coming together uh, annually to update metadata and be, be metadata geeks, but also uh, get jazzed about it. Um, so that's, that's kind of on the, on the formal side. In terms of the executive director search, uh, we've been talking a lot about having a search consultant, so I think we will uh, be retaining someone in that way, really, because we don't actually have a, a staff. Um, Emily uh, is, is will it. transition. <laughs> Emily is it. She's <laughs> awesome. Um, and I don't think she's not even technically on the DPLA Inc. Uh, payroll, because we don't have a payroll yet, um, <laughs> but hopefully we will. Uh, but, the, um, but the process in, uh, in the next several months will be, we have a very initial draft job, job, draft job description, which we've sent around uh, on the listservs. We'll formalize that into a, a more attractive and uh, literal job description, but if you in the audience um, or online are interested in the job, please let either me or Maura know probably uh, initially, or if you have suggestions, nominations, we'll be putting certainly a form up for people to put in uh, nominations. I think it's, um, it's not entirely make or break, but it's pretty close in terms of getting the right executive director to lead this um, for the first several years. And that person, I think, just needs to be a totally mission-driven human being. Um, and she or he has to want to wake up every morning and change the world and have the ability to work with a very broad group of people inclusively and actively and, and kind of lovingly um, to get there in, in an urgent um, kind of way. So uh, I think it's, I think it'd be an amazing opportunity for someone really to contribute to the world. And I'm quite Quite sure you are out there, um, whoever you might be, but it'll be exciting. Thanks for that. I did want to see if, again, anyone out there had input for you about, you know, you talked about the board having committees. We've had this very large community that's been so important to the progress that DPLA has made. Is there input from you all here about where we should focus and where we should push. Some people have suggested there might be a committee on uh, community colleges, for example, that we might focus on user groups. Others have suggested we might focus on types of content. You know, maybe it's important to have an ebook uh, lending working committee, that type of thing. I don't know if you. Any comments from the, the live stream, maybe? Go on. Martin asks. Do you hope to grow the membership of the board? What will you look for new members? And then just one other question from Rigel MD. Do you have a strategy for extending the social benefit of this project to our substantial incarcerated population? So, um, I heard the first half of that, but not the second, so I can answer the first part. Um, in, in terms of the, mem the, the size of the board, the nominating committee um, asked the board as one of its first acts to extend itself from five to seven members. So one of the early to-dos is to add two more members. And I think you know, we, we are committed to looking out across the country and across the field to say what are the pieces that are not yet represented in the first five of us and, and, and figure out that process. And we'll also need to structure the terms and so forth so we can have some uh, continuity as, as things go along. So right now, we've set up the bylaws so that we each have three-year terms renewable once. Um, we realize that we need to stagger that so we don't all go off the board at one moment and then have an entire new board go on. But anyway, I'm sorry, I was being distracted as the... The second, second question was about whether DPLA has a strategy to serve incarcerated communities. And I know that, you know, the one community that I've heard referenced is uh, the site-disabled community. It's the first community that we've really made a commitment to serve. I don't know that. I mean, I think that's the power of DPLA. It's anytime, anywhere, any place at no cost, as long as there's wireless and connections. So the incarcerated community certainly will be able to benefit from the work here. And I would think that if there's a certain sub-community of that that we want to think about moving ahead in some ways, we yeah. certainly have that opportunity to do that, because this will be a huge network yeah. that we'll build on. We might want to bring the mic to Bob, Bob to talk about community colleges since he made that, yeah, that argument before. Are you willing, Bob, to make your case? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, one thing we've not stressed perhaps as much as we might have is the pedagogical mission of the DPLA. Uh, it, the opportunities are simply endless. And I think if you look over our national educational system, one thing stands out, and that is the community colleges. There are more students in community colleges than exist in the four-year colleges and universities. Uh, the community colleges provide an extraordinary channel for people who somehow got off course to get back onto course and achieve a higher education, but they operate under very difficult circumstances. Many don't have adequate libraries. So it seems to me that the DPLA is an ideal asset for community colleges. They can have uh, digitally access to the entire cultural heritage of the country and really of the world. However, it's easy to say this, to make it happen is something else. And I've talked a fair amount with some of the community college leaders, and if you simply say to them, um, you can have access to the cultural heritage of the country, you know, they roll their eyes because they've got specific problems of helping students get through their programs. Many of the students are working full time, not just part time. And so I think we need to work out a strategy for the DPLA to offer its riches, uh, which are of a, a quality of expertise as well as the kind of content it will make available to the community colleges. One suggestion that came up uh, yesterday actually in discussions was to go to the college board and to say, let's design advanced placement uh, packages, courses that could be offered in high schools that then could feed into the community colleges utilizing DPLA material. So uh, having seen these wonderful productions from Kentucky and uh, Minnesota, you get some sense of how that could energize classes of students who are concerned with local issues but also often local issues that have national repercussions or to look at the local issues from a national perspective. So in short, I think the community colleges is one area that the future DPLA should concentrate on because of the possibility of really contributing to the pedagogical needs of the country. Thanks, Bob. You know, another thought I have is the one of the aspirations of DPLA is to also just transform the way that we work as professionals who are working in libraries, museums, and archives. And another group that we've thought about uh, is the, the group of library students. You mention it, and the retired librarians. There's a lot of manpower out there, and there's a lot that can be done, even in the way that we teach people to, to work in this profession. And we think that DPLA provides an incredible opportunity for that group. I just saw Michelle Clunin, who oh, is she here? Dean Excellent. of Simmons Graduate School of Library and Information Science, and she's over there, and we're going to call on her. Cold call. Right about now. Right about now, as the microphone approaches, to see if she has thoughts on how her students could get engaged. We've, we've had brief conversations about Just them coming to, into the hubs. To buy yeah. uh, Michelle a moment of time as she gathers her thoughts, one of the aspirations we've had within the Secretariat is to make this the single coolest library internship that anybody could get mm -hmm. um, working on the DPLA. And there have been a few. There are some wonderful interns we've had already. Um, and certainly the uh, Emily Gore-inspired Scannabago is yet he another. He has not stopped talking Scanabago. about the Scannabago <laughs> anyway, since it's Emily it's introduced it. still in our future. It. Anyway, yep. Michelle. So I had two ideas. Um, one is that um, uh, most LIS programs today um, have very strong uh, chapters of the professional associations. And uh, at these professional associations, there's often student posters and activities. So um, an ALA is one organization that has student chapters throughout the United States. So I think engaging students in that way is one idea. And then I was just thinking when Mara and I were chatting in the ladies' room, where I do most, <laughs> much of my networking with people, um, 
<laughs> that we have something called the alternate spring break. And we do things like um, in the Boston area, school libraries that don't have um, librarians anymore. Our students go and um, collect books, catalog books, read to students, that kind of thing. But doesn't this seem like the ideal thing for an alternative student break? Um, because it's the same kind of community engagement. Um, and I think that students are so adept now um, at finding communities both um, in person and and um, via many new technologies that we could use them to engage um, in this project in that way as well. So those are two quick thoughts, but I'm sure I can come up with some more before the end of the afternoon. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. You, you touched on this aspect, too, that's important of DPLA, about bringing together the digital and the physical, bringing people into our community spaces to uh, engage with materials that are now digital and oh i think amy has left amy ryan has left i was going to cold call her she also had to that's get why she left plane. tomorrow she knew, <laughs> she knew <laughs> it was coming. well you know we've seen some good work already with i'm being dan jones is pointing ah patrick pa hand patrick blazinski's there he can pick that hey mara and Hi. john and uh others i'm uh uh, asking a question about how you have thought about the challenge of branding. It seems to me that it's uh, DPL, DPLA is going to emerge as an incredibly strong brand. Uh, the challenge is how do we keep the local brand strong as well, particularly with smaller institutions. At some point as DPLA becomes even more successful, uh, some local smaller institutions might even be threatened by the popularity of DPLA. So what advice do you have for keeping that local brand strong alongside the greater brand of DPLA? I'll take an initial response, Patrick, and then let uh, my colleagues answer too. Um, as I've said many times, I think that the, the way in which people will engage with the DPLA is almost certainly going to be more often through a, lo a local library than directly through DPLA. I've been thinking about this as an 80-20 kind of heuristic where I expect that 80% of the time people will come to DPLA aggregated content through the Cleveland or Columbus Public Libraries or the Boston Public Library or um, the uh, Dwight's in South Carolina and that it will be local librarians curating metadata and uh, content, books, uh, images, whatever it might be for local communities, for students in, for instance, community colleges or for school children doing their insect uh, you know, project in the sixth grade. So I actually think that the, the DPLA will succeed the more that it allows for public libraries to succeed so that um, in fact, I'd rather submerge the brand in that way. 20% of the time, I do think people will come to dp.la and, and go to it. Um, I think that the, the name has, um, though there, you know, we've talked many times about whether uh, the name itself is problematic, I think that the name has taken on a positive uh, valence uh, and that it's actually been a, a good thing, but it's certainly thinking about marketing, communication, and branding is something that we'll, we'll continue to talk about. But you all may have, have fresh thoughts on this that are less recycled than my own. You know, I think building on what you're saying, I, I, my own thinking or my own vision of it is that DPLA is kind of the infrastructure underlying other libraries in some ways. It's a digital infrastructure and that it's like the Intel inside chip. It's mm -hmm. kind of like run on DPLA or... So I, I think that DPLA will have a, a national brand, but I feel like that really it will be sublimated in a lot of ways to the local library brand or, you know, other digital libraries that people might more intrinsically interact with. But I, I, I think we should probably look at, is this the right name? Is this the right brand? What are we doing about it as we move forward so we're not in five years saying, hmm, we really missed an opportunity that maybe we should have thought about at the outset. So. Yeah, my only thought is that um, if we build the network correctly, in some ways DPLA is part of the infrastructure. So it, it starts right now with the hub and we're all spoking in, but if we build it right, DPLA, DPLA comes underneath it in some ways and is supportive of all the entities that are on top. And, but it's a little tricky because this is new. You know, will DPLA be on the top and the other institutions below, or will it be below and supporting? And I don't think we can answer that question yet, but I think we can be very aware as we move ahead and that we certainly, the objective is not to push out other entities in any other way, but to keep all the brands strong around the library archives and museums 
and to make sure that we have those opportunities as we move ahead. So I think, I think it's tricky because we don't know, but I think the more we're aware of it, then we can just adjust as we move ahead. I think all of us are involved in this project because we care about knowledge, we care about libraries, we care about archives, we care about museums. And the point is nobody wants to undermine what we're trying to support. And as we've said many times, this is a project with no mothers or fathers, even though there are uh, certainly some uh, clearly uh, important uh, people in setting it up. And I think if we sort of keep that same spirit of a very low ego involved and really focus on our mission and the people we're trying to serve, I think, I think we can get a long way in that way. Yeah, Patrick, you're a large urban public library, but you work with lots of smaller libraries. How do you, how do you see DPLA serving their needs? Well, I'm gonna go back to the branding real quickly. I, yeah. I think at the end of the day, um, I don't think this is an issue for the Columbus Metropolitan Library, but I think small libraries uh, at, at some point um, face severe funding threats. Um, this wonderful resource, you can easily see how some local um, funders might say, gosh, we don't need quite as much now with this wonderful uh, DPLA in place. And so uh, as local people go into a voting booth to support their local library, my concern is how do we do this in tandem? All of us understand the goodness of DPLA and the intentions and keeping egos low. I just think we have to keep awareness in place that we have to have strategies for those smaller institutions to keep their brand alive at the same time. And um, so I, I think this is going to be a boon to, to small libraries and uh, smaller institutions. So that, that's not the issue. I'm going to ask Maureen Sullivan just to frame that in, from her seat before we, before we move on. I wanted to respond with two points. The first is, this is yet another example of what's so wonderful about these convenings, because you're raising something that has not yet been addressed, but is a really important issue. But as you were framing your question, I was thinking, I envision this entity to be at least in three dimensions, and maybe more. And I think one of the things we want to do is we want to create a graphic depiction of all of its different components whenever we can do that. But I also think as we go forward, we want to be mindful of this value of inclusivity that we have. And I think we want to be thinking in the four streams that just run through my head every time I think about this. We have a responsibility to continue to communicate. We have a responsibility to create the opportunity for convening where these issues can be addressed. We have a serious responsibility to do research and to publish the research about the conditions that we're trying to meet. And the one you're really raising for me, Patrick, is the importance of education. And I think we have opportunities to reach out to the funders of local libraries to make a very clear case for where the opportunities are here, but why this is not a substitute for the support. In fact, it's really going to be an effort that I think is going to highlight the need for local support of these community assets, in which we have been investing for centuries in this country. And we have to preserve them. So I would thank you for the question. I thought that was great. No, it's a great question and great answer. Thank you, Maureen. Um, if there are any other questions, I see a hand in the back there. And Dwight has something to say here. Dwight first, because the microphone's there. And then we'll go to the back, and you second. Um, th thank you. This is to uh, address uh, the, the comments uh, that were made. Uh, um, we've all heard that Google is going to replace uh, all libraries. Uh, I, I'm sure that everyone has heard that, uh, that we don't need libraries anymore because we have Google, and, and Google provides all. Um, but, it, but it's just not so. Um, all politics are local. All resources are local. Uh, we who are in the small communities, we know that Kathy Sue has in her attic Aunt Emma's records uh, from uh, the uh, 1920s when she was a suffragette. And nobody else on the planet knows that. And it's up to us to make sure that the funders know that we have that information and that we're the best place to also um, describe the content that nobody else can. Not from Harvard, not from Columbus, Ohio, not from Washington, D.C. And so that's our strength. But we do have to advocate that. And we do have to make that clear because 
you're absolutely right. There will be the people that say libraries are outmoded. You know, they're like old record stores, no longer needed because we have Google. Thank you. Dwight, thank you. As always, a great representative of small and rural libraries. Can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, when I was at Google, and I no longer am there, so this is not an official comment, <laughs> but um, we often got asked precisely that question, and really what we found with the advent of book search was that there was a lot of increase in traffic to local libraries, and in fact, instead of decreasing people's need and desire to be in the local library, it actually increased. And so that, that, that's just a useful point, I think, for us to take away from my long ago now experience there. But, and, and I think a good point for funders of all types to know that, that people increasingly depend on local librarians or their, their local library for resources and for help in understanding how to use digital technology. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that Emily Gore's idea of the Scannabago and also these regional scanning hubs was something we really tried to crack when I was at Google. And I think one of the things that really differentiates this project from what we were doing at Google is that there is such local support and local interest and the regional hubs are really an innovative, amazing idea that I think Google could never have, I shouldn't say never, but. Um, <laughs> Once a Google employee. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is live. It's confusing, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Recorded for posterity. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's an amazingly innovative idea that was a nut we just could not crack when I was at Google. I think, I think that's true, right? Exactly. <laughs> didn't have to hear. Live stream. <laughs> there was a question in the back, right there. Yep. I I, um, I thought what Paul Courant said about um, government information was really important, and at, at federal, state, and local levels, if we could if we could um, disseminate all that government information that has been published over the years. That would be a really powerful um, boost for the DPLA. And are, are there efforts to be working on that al already? There are. And I, I think if Carl Malamud, one of our former steering committee members, were here, he would be jumping up and down on the stage. And we should actually share with you some of his remarks. He's actually published uh, one of his previous DPLA speeches on exactly this topic. Um, he argues in favor of a federal scanning commission um, and has put together an extensive plan around that. And yes, uh, we scan. Yes, we scan is his uh, is yeah. the theory. Um, <laughs> That's true. And you know, I think I think we stand at a moment where we just have to choose among a series of things to be our next steps towards something great. Um, and I think the the idea of getting federal resources to be published through this mechanism, among other mechanisms, is an obvious one. You could imagine all the federal court records, for instance. That's something that doesn't happen to exist in a single place. You know, you have to go to the Supreme Court uh, website to get Supreme Court opinions and you know, other federal courts. There are just so many obvious things, not subject to copyright, you know, which is you know, a very difficult issue for us for uh, the 20th and 21st century. That's out of the way under the US copyright um, statute. So I think there's amazing opportunity there. I think the question is only an opportunity cost one and which things do we go after first. I think in our initial effort, and I see Emily calling for the mic, which is good, um, I'd like to see us demonstrate a little bit of a bunch of different things so we can kind of show the types. Um, and then let's make the political case to do this and let's get the government printing office to be behind this and showing up at events too and actually you know, making it happen. So I think there are, there are plenty of partners here who could um, help us supercharge that and there's absolutely no reason not to do it. Sorry, so it's Emily. almost lunchtime. We have Emily and then one last uh, question here, short ones, but thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say that some of the hub pilot participants already have a significant amount of, of state as well as government documents. Um, one of them coming out of South Carolina digitizing a um, 1.5 million pages from the National Park Service. Great. There's a large project in the CIC um, going on which Minnesota is participating in um, to digitize a large amount of federal documents. So I think we will have some as part of the pilot and obviously can, can keep that in mind moving forward. That's great. Oh, one, as right the mic here. goes over here, let me just add one note, which is that though federal copyright um, doesn't preclude um, us using in any way the um, federal uh, 
government documents, there are many states, a few dozen states, that still claim copyright over state records, which is, to me, just perverse. So uh, of, the, of the things that seem like obvious areas of advocacy um, for the DPLA, I think it's to sort of show the gaps out there in some of these kind of ridiculous policies, like why there should be you know, state copyright claims in public records um, that I think we as a community, as we kind of fill this out, could help to, help to nudge. Thank you, John. So this is another comment about the kind of pedagogical um, potential of DPLA. Something we discussed yesterday at one of our tables was the um, possibility of building um, teaching guides around the material here. And I think that I'd suggest thinking into the future possibly a real strategic and explicit um, collaboration with the teaching organization to create some kinds of lesson plans or teaching guides about the material because that really, the work I've done with our public schools in Chicago, teachers really need to have some way into digital collections. They don't have the time to do all of the work themselves and I think that would really be something that would would leverage the possibilities here. Thank you. We're hoping that our friends in Minnesota will share the work they've done through the Hubs pilot and that that will become a part of DPLA indeed. And I, I took that to be Bob's point about yep. potentially creating some modules for community colleges and then I, as a high school principal, I'd love to see that happen too. So as you've seen, Kathy Casserly had to leave us as well to catch a flight. Uh, the, oh, something's happening out there. The board is at your disposal for comments and questions and all, so please uh, share your thoughts with them on the future of the DPLA. Now it's time for lunch. Before we break, take a look at your ID uh, the purple dots, this was done because of fire code. We had to divide everyone into two rooms. So the purple dots are straight ahead. Uh, I don't know what that room is called. Reception. The reception hall. And the blue dots are in the multi-purpose room, which is a little bit to the left. As you leave, we'll be reconvening at 2.30. 2 2 30. 30. And we thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Maura. All right. <laughs>